Good morning. Well, it's good to see everybody gathering on in today. Everybody doing well today? Awesome, awesome. Let's rise to our feet. And uh, I know there are those that are getting settled, getting uh, parked, getting uh, in out of the cafe, getting all uh, ready today to have an experience with the Father. That's what we do here at Family First. We have an experience with the Father. How many sons and daughters of the Father do I have here this morning? Praise the Lord. Give, give a shout out to Daddy God this morning. Can you do that? The Bible says we have been given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father. Now we've talked about that a lot from time to time. And I think God wants us to feel close to Him. He wants us to be able to sense the intimacy that we can have a personal one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship with the Father. Now, I've always felt a little bit awkward. I don't, when I pray, I don't necessarily address God as Daddy. I, I think I have that right, and I have that invitation, but I also believe that I want to maintain the honor and the integrity of the relationship, because not only is He my Father God, how many know that He's also the Lord God of Almighty Heavens? He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we ask or think. So today, no matter what is in your life, no matter what you might be facing, no matter what you may be uh, going through, God today is able to show up in your situation and make a difference. How, how many have a need today? Can I see your hand? And maybe there's physical needs. There's other kinds of needs. I know of people that need the power of God to just show up in their world and, and change some things, to shift some things in the atmosphere. So I want you to shoot your hands up all across the room this morning. And in the name of Jesus, we just begin right now to change change the environment. I heard a word this morning on a song that has just stuck in my spirit, and it said this, Lord, this is my prayer today. If you'll just agree with me in this, Lord, that you would be enthroned on the praises of a thousand generations. Get a hold of that thought. God is going to be enthroned today on the praises of a thousand generations. When we get to heaven, there will be generations from the time of beginning to even now that will join together their verses, their voices, and their praise and their honor to God. So God, we lift you up today, and we know that your, your worship changes the environment. Demonic influences are purged in the name of Jesus. Every influence, we begin to declare, oh, come on, somebody, partner with me on this. No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper today. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Then thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. No sickness in heaven, let it come down to earth. No weakness in heaven, let strength come down to earth. Nothing in the enemy's camp that would invade this territory, but we give you praise and honor. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Put your hands together. Come on, let's give him a praise. Give him a worship. Lift up exaltation, honor, and celebration to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, as you know, here at Family First, we invite people to come down. If you want to move out of your seats, just come on down. Get in this altar area. This is just kind of like the splash zone. This is like SeaWorld. This is like Universal. We're here to have a good time. We're here to get close to the anointing, close to the presence of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give him our praise. Amen. Amen. Stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole with holy thunder? Who leaves his breathless in and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is a Failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would 
circumstance. Father, we give you a praise. When the night's holding on, when things look desperate, when things look dark, but you're still there. Father, we praise you this morning.
If you can just leave that chorus up on the screen. You know, I want to ask you a simple question this morning. Why are you here? Sometimes we have to stop because we're, we're creatures of habit and sometimes we wake up Sunday morning and we find ourselves in our Sunday best driving to church and have no idea why we came and how we arrived. But I'm reminded of a scripture in the Psalms where it says, As a deer panteth for the water, so, so does my soul. And you got to understand that that scripture was written about a particular type of deer that lived up in the mountain. And it had to get so desperate for the water that it would take the risk of going down to the valley, to the rivers or the streams, and, and, and go up upon all the obstacles and possibly even get eaten by mountain lions or whatever predator was down there. But the thirst was so intense that licking the rocks on the, the mountaintops or the, the dew from the lilies or whatever was up there didn't suffice. I need to submerge myself in something with some substance. I, I have to have more than just the trickle that I get here and there. I gotta, I gotta dive in. And I, and, I, and I would propose to you that sometimes we come to church out of mechanisms and out of, out of just routine but I want to encourage you this morning you're here and nothing comes close there's absolutely nothing that you can throw on the table and try to compare to who you got your God is listen I love my wife but nothing comes close I love my kids but nothing comes close I love my family but nothing comes close I love my church but nothing comes close So I want to encourage you, if you got dressed this morning and you, you guys look beautiful, it's a beautiful family here. If you got dressed and you made the efforts, why don't we get past what happened during the week? Why don't we get past probably the kids kind of being rowdy this morning and maybe a couple of disagreements with the wife or just life in general. Let's get off the, 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 the cliff on the mountainside and let's get desperate. Let's go deep. 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 I don't know if you've recognized what God is doing in this house, but God is preparing this house to be a river to this community. Amen. We got a, a, a dry and thirsty land that is hungry and is thirsty for water. And I, and I love it because hunger, Jesus said, if you eat of me, right? And then he says, if you drink of me, you're never thirsty again. So he, he covered two of the main, main issues, right? The drive of man is to feed himself and be hydrated. And he says, first and foremost, if you partake of me, everything else, everything else. So this morning, if I can just have them sing that again, I want everybody just to lift your hands. Come on.
And just make this your anthem this morning. Let him know that despite your beautiful home, nothing comes close. Despite getting the car that you've always wanted, nothing comes close. Despite a beautiful marriage and a beautiful family, the perfect job, nothing comes close. Father God, I pray right now in the precious name of your son. Father, that you will unleash a river, a river in this place, dear God. Father God, we don't have time to wait around in puddles. Dear God, in the name of your son, we pray, Father, to be overcome. Hallelujah. Come on. Some of you are getting it. Come on. Let that be your anthem. of living water, dear God. Rivers of living water. Rivers. 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 Rivers of living water. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name, O oh God. Give him some praise this morning. Come on, just worship. Just give him some honor today. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 You know, I thought I was going to share this a little bit later today, but I'm just going to go ahead and share it right now. Uh, I just feel like this, this is the appropriate time. I think everybody's kind of connecting right now. Everybody's awake, right? Everybody's listening. We're connected to the Lord. Uh, how many uh, received a lot of strength? in our conference last week, the Strength Conference with Dr. Sean Strong. I mean, give the Lord a hand of praise. That was just absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Doctor, uh, how many would agree that Dr. St Dr. Strong is a strong man <laughs> in the spirit, strong in his word, strong in his personality. And uh, aren't you, how many were here Wednesday night? Can I see? Bring our lights up just a little bit so I can see everybody a little bit closer. Wednesday night. Wasn't Wednesday night just absolutely phenomenal? Uh, turn, go, so and don't get confused, but turn to your neighbor and say, I'm too fat. Come on, go ahead and tell them that. Uh, I'm too fat for the anything that the enemy would try to do in my life. I'm too fat for that. I'm too fat for attack. I'm too fat for weakness. I'm too fat for intimidation. I'm too fat for any obstacle. I'm too fat for any ap accusation. No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper because I'm too fat for that. You say, what that's all about? Isaiah 10 and 27 says the anointing shall break the yoke. And literally in the text, it says the anointing shall be broken because literally in the Hebrew, because you have grown so fat with the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, here's what I've been praying into the last couple of days. It was a marvelous week and we had a wonderful time. Very, very busy week. And uh, I was praying into the service this morning. And uh, actually, this morning early, I came over to the uh, to the church, got here before anybody else, turned off the alarm. Only thing.
band that was here was a couple of uh, angels, and, and we just worshiped the Lord for a little while. And the Lord dropped some things into my spirit. Uh, and Pastor Omar, you, you confirmed to me a minute ago that it's time to go ahead and say this. Amen. What he said is God has prepared this house to be a river of anointing to this community and to this city. I believe that. I'm convinced of that. How many of you agree with that? How many of you are partnering with that and, and praying into that? And, and I, I believe that in order for that to happen, there needs to be a, a shift. I, I told Dr. Sean, I said, thank you so much for the deposit of great anointing that you, uh, that you left at our church last week. And I believe that God is preparing us and putting us right. There's so many details. There's so many things that God is orchestrating behind the scenes to put a smack dab in the middle of a great move of God. But here's what I think has to happen. Now, just receive this. I'm not really preaching right now. I am, but it's not the real sermon. You know what I mean? In order for us to experience everything God has for us, there has to be a, a shift in our thinking. Uh, how many are familiar with the word a paradigm shift? That, that's a different way of looking at something. That's a shift in the way that you've always seen something. There has to be a paradigm shift in the church. I don't just mean this church. I mean the church, the church across America, the church around the world. We have to look at things differently. One of the things we have to look at differently is sonship. We have to realize that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's why I'm preaching about this thing, about the orphan spirit. This is going to be the ninth week that I've dealt with this subject. We have got to have a revelation of sonship. I don't care if you are a father, you are still a son. I don't care if you're a mother, you're still a son. I know you're little confused but God has female and male sons and daughters of God and when you have a revelation it overcomes all of the accusation when you have a reconciliation it overcomes the abandonment the brokenness the separation because the spirit of adoption lives up in our spirits and we come into the relationship we have I'm gonna tell you what we've got to have some other paradigm shifts this is my message. I know you've heard it before. You won't be surprised. I think we have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we view honor. I think we have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we view covenant. We have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we deal with the family of the church. Covenant and honor and relationships in the body of Christ that's what God is going to use in this hour. I really believe it to give the world an example of what God can do in their life. Jesus prayed in John 21 or John 17 in the great high priestly prayer. He said, God, I pray that you and I may be one and his church may be one so that the world will know that you have sent me. I'm all for signs and wonders. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting right now, but I know you're listening. I'm all for signs and wonders. I'm all for the experiences with God. I'm all for manifestations. If God wants us to shout and dance and jump, we'll shout and dance and jump. If God wants us to fall on the floor, we'll fall on the floor. If God wants to do healings and miracles and get people up out of wheelchairs, I just sense a, a prophetic word to say this. Somebody has been seeing in their spirit life as they pray in the spirit, Miss Linda Spies walking into this body of Christ. I'm just telling you, Pastor, that's crazy. Yeah, that's okay. I believe that God can do it in the next name of Jesus. And Miss Linda, you're watching right now. I'm praying for that happen in the name of Jesus. God can do all the kinds of things. But I'll tell you what will make a greater impact in people's lives than even signs, wonders, and miracles. Jesus said some won't even believe even if someone rose from the dead. How many know Jesus said that? And he did rise from the dead. And some don't believe even though someone rose from the dead. That's pretty dramatic. But I tell you what people won't deny. They cannot deny a culture of honor that is established in a body of Christ where the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace creates an environment that when you walk in this room, it feels like you have stepped into another world. It feels like you have stepped into a whole different paradigm. You've come into a place where there's love and there's honor and there's covenant and there's relationship and all of those things are, are so, we have got to have, I really believe we've got to have a revelation of all these things and some things to shift. Some people say, well, we just need revival. We just need excitement. We just need a lot of noise. If noise would have done it, 
it would have been done a long time ago. Come on, I'm preaching pretty good. If signs, wonders, and miracles would have done it, it would have all been done in Jesus' day. But the church has come into the unity of the Spirit and through the covenant and honor and through the paradigm of the unity of God's people, mighty, mighty things will happen. Come on. If everybody just lift your hands up to God with me. Come on. Lift your hands up to God. Pray this, pray this out loud with me. Dear God, I want to be a part of your church. That is a church that's unified. That is a church that's anointed. That is a church that understands covenant. That is a church that understands honor. Come on, help me, church. This is not this is not just spectating. This is participating. I want to be a part of the church that touches our city because we create a different experience in the lives of people. It's not of this world. It transforms the things of this world. And it's your power and your spirit in our lives. God, I just pray that as we continue to press in, in these fall months, as we continue to press in, Lord, believing the 2020 vision, believing the all-in uh, campaign, believing that you're going to fill this house up twice, 400 people by the end of December 2016. God, as we press into all of those things, we know it will happen not by might nor power, but by the Spirit of the living God. As we walk in honor, and as we walk in covenant with one another, praise you. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. 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 You can be seated. You, you can be seated. I, I just want to get this out so that when I preach a little while later, I'll just go on into the story of the prodigal son. How many know what I mean by a reformation? Just, just bring down just, just a little bit, guys. I just want to talk to my family here for a second. A reformation. What's a reformation? A reformation is greater than a revival. Because a revival might renew something, but a reformation will forever change the system of which that process works through. A lot of people talk about, well, we need an awakening. And that's great. If people are asleep, you need to wake up. Turn to your neighbor and say, if you're asleep, you need to wake up. Come on, go ahead and tell them that. But a reformation is greater than an awakening. A reformation is greater than a revival. A reformation is, is greater than, than a renewal. A reformation changes the way we look at things. I'm going to teach you for a moment. Can, can you learn something before the offering? How many can learn something before I start preaching? Can you learn something even before the offering? When you have a reformation in your life, you never look at something the same way again after that moment. I was talking to someone in the office the other day, and I remember the conversation, and we were talking about the Reformation that happened. If you don't know this, it would be a good little thing for you to learn. In the 17th, later 1600s, 1700s, Dr. Martin Luther led the church in Reformation. Before that, there was the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church operated in a system, and still does, of works based righteousness. That means you get right with God by doing good works, by doing penance, by doing good deeds, by walking according to the commandments of the Holy uh, Catholic Church, and, and their paradigm is justification by works. But Martin Luther had a revelation, and so he wrote an article, and he tacked it to what was called the Wittenberg Door at the church in Wittenberg, Germany, and it was his 95 thesis, and he declared Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 that says the just shall live by faith and he led the church into a new way of looking at things. In the 1700s the church came into an awakening a reformation that said we realize now it's not justification by works. I can do every good work in the book. I can do every good deed possible. It will not purchase me a living relationship with Jesus Christ. I am only saved by grace through faith and if it wouldn't have been for that reformation we would not be walking as the people of God in the spirit of justification by faith that we are the body of Christ today. So a reformation changes everything. You see, let me give you one more example real quick. In 1900, people began to get baptized, what we call in the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, 
outside of the day of Pentecost, you know, in the Bible and a few small groups here and there, there was no widespread outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People weren't praying in the Spirit. People weren't praying in their prayer languages. They weren't speaking in tongues. There were not prophecies in the church. There were not spoken messages to be interpreted in the church and so on. But around 1900, something shifted and there was a paradigm. And that shift that started in that Pentecostal Reformation continued to gain strength until our fellowship, the Assemblies of God, was birthed in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And it continued to gain momentum. This is a little history lesson for you. It's okay. You're learning some things. And in the 1940s, there were camp meetings. There were tent revivals. There were moves of God all across America. And that Pentecostal move that was started with a reformation around the turn of the century continued to gain strength. How many have heard of the charismatic renewal of the 70s? How many of you got caught up in the charismatic renewal of the 70s? And all of a sudden, a lot of people... People. They were church people. They were good people, but they didn't have the reality of a Pentecostal prayer language. They began to realize that stadiums would be filled all across America, and it was in the hippie generation. People would play guitars, and they would sing these little worship songs, and the presence of Jesus would just sweep across entire stadiums. What I'm telling you is that when there's a paradigm shift, it's no going back. It's forever advancing forward. I believe we're at that moment. I believe we're at that time. Church is not about us. That's the paradigm shift the American church has got to grasp. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about my feelings. Not about my emotions. Not about my preferences and my it's oh I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna wade into this right now so just brace yourself. It's not about me finding a church that I think that's the church I like because I like those people. They sing the songs I like to sing. The pastor preaches the way I want him to preach. I feel the emotional things that I like to feel when I go to that church. That's why I go to that church. Now that's an old paradigm. The new paradigm is I'm at this body of Christ because God has planted me here. And just when I stood at the altar and I said to my wife and we came into covenant, we said till death do us part, we come into a body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, we say, you know what? I'm here and I don't care what happens. I'm not going anywhere because God planted me here. Come hell or high water for sickness and in health, for good or for bad. When I get my feelings stroked or if they get my toes stomped on, I'm still going to be here. I'm going to sit under the leadership that God has assigned to me because I want that paradigm shift to happen to the body. Now, how many would agree with me that if we could get that mentality to sweep across America, things would change? It would. I'll tell you what, it would change overnight. And what we've got to do then is realize there's no substitute. So instead of, uh, what's that? I got that thing in my mind about an organ grinder, you know, the monkey. You ever seen this monkey that's cranking up the organ grinder? He, he just wants that, that same sound, and he just wants that same environment. And, and that's what we do at church. We come and we want to get the monkeys. Not, no, 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 no offense to the worship team here this morning. No, no reference to Pastor Omar or to myself. But the monkeys can crank on the organ, crank all they want to do, and we can create the noise. But if the paradigm shift doesn't happen, it'll continue to be business as usual. I'm preaching. I'm going to get me a CD of this. Praise God. I'm going to listen to this. And I'm going to bless myself. Oh, praise God. Anybody get hold of this? Are, are you in your agreement? Praise God. So here's what we're doing. I'm just shifting all over the place. So Omar, I might need your help here in a minute to, to talk about the, the vision. If you could jump into this in a moment. That's why in this season... We're saying we're all in. How many of you are all in? I see your hand. So do this. Now I'm all in. <laughs> you, sometimes you got to suck it in to be all in. But how many of you are all in? I mean, you're all in with God. You're all in with family first. You're all in with your assignment. You're all in with what God's doing in your life. Can I tell you what? I'm saying this as sincerely as I possibly can. If your neighbors know that you're all in at Family First, 
that will mean more to them than if you say, we got the best band in town. Amen. We got the most handsome preacher in the county. We, we got the best environment. We got the softest seats. They don't really care about that stuff. They want to know that something happens here that causes you to feel like you would be lost without your friends and your family in the body of Christ. Hey, come on, help, help me out here. Uh, talk a little bit. We're, we're representing the vision. We're talking about people being all in. So just, we're just kind of out of the box here. So amen, on. amen, amen. This is one of the things pastor's talking about, the Reformation and paradise, paradigm shift. One of the things that made me think about it was Joshua and Caleb. You know, they had heard the stories for so, so long, you know, 40 years in the wilderness, and, and they had made up their mind that what they wanted. And regardless of how big the enemies looked and what God had promised them, they knew God would deliver into their hands, right? Their perspective had been skewed at one point or another in their life where it didn't matter what stood before them, the mountain belonged to them. Are you getting that? I've gone to, if you've, anybody's ever gone to a museum and you look at some of these abstract pieces of art, you stand there and you're like, why does this cost $1.2 million when I can't tell what it is? It just looks like smears and it looks like who would have thunk it, right? But if the artist was right behind you and you asked him, what does this mean? And he took you through the, the evolution of that painting, the heart, the mindset. All of a sudden you understand why the, br uh, the brush stroke with the blue came this way and why the red went this way, and why there was a circle in this corner. And next time you came up on that drawing, you cannot outdo the perspective that was given to you earlier. You're, there was a reformation. You don't look at it the same anymore. You're stuck on the vision of the artist. How many got that? Doesn't matter. Somebody might come up and say, I don't know what this is. And you sit there and you're like, ah, oh, this, is, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. God is, has placed a vision in this place, right? And what he's doing now, he's, he's recalling it. Because now, the thing is, is I just spoke to someone last night. Pastor, had he dumped this, the, the, the level of the blessing of this vision at the time that it was given, it would have been aborted. He's been placing people in the right places, establishing characters, getting rid of certain mindsets and bringing in new ones, reformation, rethinking. I think at, at the very root of it, it's almost the rethinking is we can do this because he's on our side. Amen. The city can be one for God because he's on our side. We can reach into the homes, into the homeless community, whatever the Lord places on our hearts because he's on our side. Amen. And one of the things this, this body wants to do is be that conduit of heaven to our community. And what, it, what it's going to take is for us to be all in. Listen, me being all in might not be the same level of all in you're in. Because I need you to be all in in one area. While I'm all in in the other area. And then our, our, our anointings and, and giftings overlap. And we, we create this safety net. This catch net. That we could just drag. Like fishermen do to, to get the, the, the scallops or whatever. They, they drag the bottom and they just grab whatever. We're creating this net that we're just going to throw out there in the community. And we're just going to start dragging and capturing. Capturing the lost. Hallelujah. Amen. But scripture says without vision my people perish. It's important for us to have something before us that we can shoot for. And if you look at another translation it says without restraint. That's without control. One thing that I learned in leadership class a long time ago, when you're dealing with business, either you establish a culture for your business or one will be established for you. And typically once, once it's established for you, pastor could take two to three years to redo that culture and get it going in the right direction. But what we've done in this house, what pastor's been striving with the leaders is this, is to establish a culture that says, as for me and my house, we're about community. We're about family. We're about the core values of our mission statements and, and embracing people and, and, and encountering God and empowering leaders. That is the mainstay. Why do we keep saying that? Omar, we're so tired of that. Because we need to keep it before us. If not, we'll lose track. We'll go somewhere else. Well, this sounds pretty good over here. Why don't we adopt this? No, here's the core values. Let me show you again.
if the ushers would come, if you, ha- I think the ushers are going to hand out one. Go ahead and hand them out. We have our mission, we have our purpose, and we have our core values. How many know what the steps are? The core values give give depth and understanding to the purpose, and the purpose is where the mission sits on top of. Right? What good is it to have a mission if there's no purpose? I have to function from not what or how I do, but from the why. How many got that? This church will function not from how we do it or what we're doing, but why we're doing it. Because Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a plan. And people fell in love with the dream. They fell in love with the vision. And he filled up the the, the DC mall with all sorts of, didn't matter. It was the dream that captured the heart. And if we can be all in, like Pastor was saying, that when we go somewhere instantly, the way we talk, the way we carry ourselves, it indicates where we come from. It, it exudes the dream and the vision. It's coming from us. And people are provoked to ask questions. Who are you? Where you come from? Who is this all in? What, what, is, what is this family first thing that I keep hearing? I can't, this name, everywhere I go, it's in the restaurants, in the laundromat, it's at the nail salon, it's at the grocery store, it's at the hardware store. Something's being mentioned. Listen, we're not trying to create buzz so we can promote ourselves. God forbid. I guarantee you the minute we lose sight of the vision, the whole thing crumbles. Because if you lose sight of the vision, you obviously lost sight of the purpose. And if you lost sight of the purpose, your core values have been compromised. And that's why important, that's why we hand it out. We gotta keep it before us, keep it before us. Because God wants to do something here. And it's crucial. I said this a long time ago. Never in the history of humanity had the, these individuals, these individuals have been in the same room. It was the same vision with anointings, with talents and giftings. I can't do this without my brother. I can't do this without my sister. I can't do this without my family. It becomes null and void. Amen? So I want to encourage you. If anything, grab a hold of what the ushers handed out. Slide it in your Bible. Put it in your, in your prayer closet. And at the end or the beginning or in the middle, break out these things and find the one thing that just speaks to your heart and join us in that. Join us in that. Listen, there's a cutter somewhere in this community. She cuts, he cuts because of pain. There's an alcoholic in this community that drinks to forget the pain. There's a son watching his father beat his wife and thinks that's status quo. There's our homeless children living in, there's 400, did you know there's 425 homeless children living in the woods somewhere in Hernando County? Did you know that? This is real statistics. If we are all in, I believe we can eradicate these things. Is it crazy? Parting the Red Sea is crazy. Being swallowed up by a fish and being spit up on the ocean shore three days later, that's crazy. Speaking nothing, something from nothing into existence, that's crazy. So why is it for me in my house to believe that there can be no homeless children in Hernando County? Right? Well, Omar, you're only focusing on Hernando. It needs to start somewhere. There needs to be a prototype. Other communities need to see what it looks like for a body of believers to come together, churches to come together and say enough is enough. No more not denomination. No more things about race. No more things about economic standing. My car's better than your car. Your church has better AC than mine. Garbage. We're setting the standard. The rest of the community will see. They will follow suit and a nation will be changed for the glory of God. It can be done. I'm convinced, Pastor. But 
pastor can't do it by himself. The worship team can't do it by themselves. Each one has a part. And all we're asking this morning is you find your part and you become all in. God bless you. Amen. And you can give this away. If, if you give it away, we'll, we'll give you another one. We, we got hundreds of them and we'll print thousands if we need to. Now, here's what, yeah, can I have that second? Here's what I think we ought to do. Now, how many know we're selling t-shirts? And, and if you want an all-in t-shirt, they're available in the cafe. We also have stickers. This sticker, it says all-in. It goes on the back of your window of your car. You can put it on a notebook. You can put it on your computer, on the back of your iPad, or wherever you want to put it. Now, I had an idea, and uh, usually when I have an idea, I, I get people to go along with it. <laughs> Even if they're not totally thrilled with it, they usually go along with it. But no, I think our team is all in favor of this. If you will take the vision brochure, now not today, I mean it could be after a while, but not right in this room, but this afternoon at the restaurant or at the gas station or at Walmart or at Publix or even in your neighborhood or even if you have a family member that doesn't come to church with us, if you will share the brochure with them, the vision statement and, and talk about why you are all in at family first if you'll share this with them and then get out your cell phone and take a selfie and and post that on facebook we will give you now these are for sale what are we selling these for these are three dollars how many would like to have one free take your picture of somebody you're giving the brochure to and we'll keep track tag us on it so that we can keep track and next Sunday morning we'll give you an absolute free sticker that you can put on the back of your car because you are all in. I hope that everyone realizes the last 10 minutes or so was totally unscripted. I had planned to say a little bit at the beginning of the preaching time but the Holy Spirit, aren't you glad we could be led by the Holy Spirit? We can just allow Him to lead us and direct us. So how many received everything we've said? And thank you, Omar, for speaking that with me and, and uh, partnering in that uh, declaration of the vision. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Go put your hands together. Give him praise and thanks. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so I have a couple opportunities I have this morning, but before that, I just wanted to welcome any guests that we have in the house Amen. today. Um, we have a short video. It's called Welcome that we just want to share with you. And um, there's little connection cards in your seat. You can fill that out while this video is playing. It's really short. It's only like a minute or so. And um, if you are here for the first time this morning, we would love to meet you afterwards in the cafe. Pastor Coates and myself and some of our other leaders, we'd love to shake your hand, get to know you. And, and um, we're so glad that you're here today at Family First. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Man, I, I love that. I saw that and I thought it was really cute. So welcome to church. Um, so the first announcement is that we're doing something a little bit unique today after service. And you, if you have a couple minutes, we would love to have all the volunteers that we can get. And um, we're going to be making a video. And it's going to be extremely simple. All you have to do is say like three words. I promise you it's going to be like really simple. Um, and you can handle it because you guys are our stars. And so um, if you want to be a part of that, we would really appreciate that. We want as many people as we can get. And um, so we're going to meet in the hallway right after service. And you can see me or Joelle if you have any questions. And I'm really excited about that. 
Um, also coming up on Wednesday nights in the month of September, which is not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, our young adults are going to be selling coffees before church at 630. We have Wednesday night family night every Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and um, we've had that going on. But this is going to be a special thing that we're going to be doing just for the month of September. And we're going to be selling some fall-flavored coffees this time. So that sounds amazing. I don't know about you, but I am so over Florida summer. It is just grew unruly hot, and I'm so sorry, sick and tired of it. So <laughs> I am ready for fall. I'm ready for sweaters and scarves. Not that it even gets that cold here, but I'm excited for fall. So we'll have some fall flavors for you then, and it's going to be fun. Um, also, coming up on Saturday, September 10th, our Women's ministry are going to be attending a Joyce Meyer conference, and it's at the Emily Arena in Tampa. And um, we're going to be leaving at 7 a.m. because the conference starts pretty early, and it is open seating, and it's free. So I know that it's going to be a packed house. If you've never heard this speaker, this lady is amazing. She is a powerful woman of God, and you will not want to miss it. So we're going to leave right in here early here on Saturday at 7 a.m., also, on that Saturday night, our young adults are going to be getting together for what we're calling Millennials Need Mentors. And I'm really excited about this because this is going to be a different thing we've never done before with our young adults. But we're just asking the young adults to bring some questions that they have that they could ask somebody who's a little older, a little more experienced, who's gone through some of the things that they're about to go through. Maybe about getting married, having kids getting a job, buying a house, you know, simple things, you know, that young adults all face as they're finding their way in the world. And so that's going to be Saturday, September 10th at 6 o'clock. We're going to have two married couples with us on that night and a single mom to share their wisdom. So I'm really excited about that. Also, today we're announcing that we are going to be having a Family First Fall Film Fest. And this is going to be really fun. We've done some movie nights in the past, but it's been a long time. So I'm excited to get the ball on, rolling on that again. We're going to have three movie nights through the, through the fall. The first one is going to be on Friday night, September 16th. And we're going to see War Room. So that's the most recent one coming up. Has everybody seen that movie? Well, good, because if you have not, then you can come on Saturday, or I'm sorry, Friday, September 16th. And this movie is amazing. You will be changed after seeing this movie. I love this movie. Also, these other movies, you can see October 21st is going to be Miracles from Heaven. And if, if you haven't heard of that movie, it's from the same director as Heaven is for Real with the story about the little boy. And then also November 18th is going to be God's Not Dead 2. And so if he's still not dead, he's still not going to be dead again. <laughs> but <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So join us for those movie nights. It'll just be fun. We'll have popcorn and candy and stuff like that. And um, also on Sunday, September 18th, I'm sure you saw the banners as you came in. We're going to be celebrating Back to Church Sunday. And as we were talking about being all in and inviting your friends, inviting your neighbors, that even as Omar said, if your neighbor doesn't know that you're all in, then that would make such an impression to them that, that you're not just saying, oh, come to my church because because I really want to hang out with you or because it's really cool, but because you can seriously have your life transformed when you, when you experience the presence of God. And so I want to encourage you to invite somebody to join us for Back to Church Sunday and to think about it, to pray about it. Maybe ask God who he would want you to invite. You know, don't just think, oh, I don't have anybody to invite. Pray about it. God will show you who he wants you to invite. I promise you there's somebody in your circle of influence who isn't saved, who could use a, a back to church Sunday. And so this is going to be an awesome Sunday morning. It's going to be September 18th. And the theme for that is now's the time. And I think that could not be any more appropriate. Hallelujah. Um, so that is it for my announcements. And um, I wanted to share one more thing with you all this morning. How many saw the insert in your program as you came in? Um, Dr. Strong, Sean Strong was with us last week for a powerful strength conference, and it was so awesome. He's an amazing man of God, and he challenged us specifically 
for one certain thing on Sunday night when he preached. She preached about honoring your pastors. And it was an amazing message, and I encourage you to listen to it. You can look it up on the live stream. You can watch it. But really, I think everybody who calls Family First their home needs to listen to this message. And so I'll give you a little homework assignment there. That was Sunday night, August 21st at 6 o'clock, Dr. Sean Strong. And um, he talked about seven keys about honoring your pastors. I'm not going to read all of those, but they are in your insert if you want to read those on your own time. And something specifically that he challenged every family at Family First to do was to sow a seed of honor into the lives of Pastor Tim and Miss Crystal for $100. And that would be into them personally. You know, Dr. Strong, he emphasized this when he spoke. You know, he said, it's not like Pastor paid me to say this. It's not like he even knew I was going to say this. But he just felt led that we need to honor our pastors. And there's several reasons why <laughs> that you can see in the keys if you read those seven points. But the most important thing is that we do it out of honor because he is the shepherd of our house and we want to show him that we appreciate all the work that he does and, and to, to honor him. And honor is not honor unless it's demonstrated with a gift. You know, if you tell somebody I honor you, but you don't have anything to show for it, then that's just a watered down version of respect, honestly. But if you tell somebody, I honor you, here's the proof of my honor, my respect in action, then they can see a tangible gift, a tangible thing to see that you really do honor them. And so we're going to be talking about that for the next couple weeks. And we would love to have every family join us in doing that. And if you do, we would love to have you do that before or on um, September 25th. I believe it's the last Sunday in September. And if you could give your gift before that or on that day, then um, on that Sunday morning, we're going to be having a special pastor's appreciation celebration. And um, usually, traditionally, pastor's appreciation month um, nationwide is in the October, but we have lots going on. So it's going to be on that Sunday morning. And I just want to encourage you. I can't even look at that. <laughs> I just want to encourage you to, um, to just overwhelm them with our honor on that day. So if the ushers could come, we're going to go ahead and receive our offering. Um, if you're giving your tithe or your offering today, why don't you go ahead and hold it up? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to sow into your kingdom, whether that's through our tithe or other offerings or 2020 or missions or whatever it is this morning, God. We give you our gift and we give it to you cheerfully because we know that it's not ours, but it's yours to give. God, that everything that we have is from you, that you are our source, that we are just stewards of what you've given us this morning. God, and so we give that back to you today because you've entrusted it with us and we want to honor you so that the seed can be blessed that goes from this house so that the harvest may be plentiful and to come to pass. Father God, we thank you so much for each and every person who is giving this morning. I pray that you would bless them abundantly. Father God, whatever they are sowing specifically in their life to, um, to have a harvest of, Father God, I pray that you would give them a double portion. God, I pray that you would overwhelm them with your blessings so there's not room to contain it, God. We thank you so much for the opportunity to honor you and to worship you. We love you. Amen. Thank you. And um, while you're giving this morning, we have a special 2020 vision video to share with you. Hi family, we want to talk to you once again today about uh, 2020 vision and I'm so excited to have with me here in the cafe Pastor Omar and before I uh, give him the opportunity to share some vision and goals with you I just want to say Omar what a blessing you are 
to uh, Family First. You and your family, since you guys have been here, we just love you and appreciate you so much. Uh, Pastor Omar does a lot of things here at the church, uh, but the official title he has is the Discipleship Team Leader. You remember we launched the soft launch of the Academy of Honor uh, some weeks back, and that was met with great success. And we wanted to share with you today some other vision goals that we have for the discipleship ministry. So welcome, Pastor Omar. Talk to our family today. Well, I'm excited to be here uh just uh, the relationship that we've created is just amazing, and I'm excited what God has in store for us. I'm excited about um, the discipleship program. I'm excited about our Academy of Honor and what it's uh, already beginning to develop into. Our soft opening opening went great. Um, attendance has been consistent, which I think is a, is a big deal. Yes. Um, we're getting ready to launch uh, officially in September. Uh, we're going to be providing the same two equip sessions, our um, Thrive and Cornerstones of Faith. And uh, we're excited because in 2017, we're going to be launching some new stuff to provide um, some more uh, opportunities for the church. And one of the things we're going to be launching is a um, Building a Better Marriage, um, which will kind of be preceded yes. by almost a um, marriage conference. So we're excited about that. And then the other thing we're going to try to implement is called Next Steps. And basically what Next Steps is, it will be offered on Sunday nights, be about an hour, hour and a half. And what our intent with that is to get you equipped to be more involved in not only in your relationship with Christ, but in the body itself. So stay tuned for that because we'll have more information as that develops. Very good, and uh, we're all in. Pastor Omar, Definitely. as other members of our creative team, have really helped us gel this idea of the all-in campaign. So get on board with that. Get all in here at Family First. Help us reach our goal uh, this year. And Amen. we're so excited to be a part of what God is doing. Good to talk with you. God bless you. God bless you. just uh, settle in this morning. Let me just say a couple things just spontaneously here for a little while. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm thankful that everything is not canned. I had a person one time in church where I was at in Missouri. He, he said in his church where he went to, and it was a denominational church, he said every Sunday, every Sunday, I can sit there and I can watch the ticks on my watch the second hand and knew exactly what was going to happen in every tick of the clock. I'm so glad that we're just a little bit more uh, open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I sensed this morning that God really wanted to, to speak. And, and I, fe I feel really uh, good right now what, what has happened, that the Holy Spirit has helped us share our vision and talk about all in and talk about these things. And so I want to preach a little while right now. And I want you to find your Bible and I want you to locate Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter number 15. I want to do my best, to be honest with you, to be somewhat spontaneous this morning in the ministry. I also want to be as brief as I possibly can. We, we took a few minutes while ago, and, and I want to honor your time, but I also want to recognize the power of the Word of God. And I want to lay a foundation today for some things that we're going to be doing in the days that are ahead. We're still doing this series, Overcoming the Orphan Spirit. This is actually the ninth message that I've preached on this series, Overcoming Overcoming the Orphan Spirit. Now that's a longer series than what I normally do, but that's because this subject is absolutely huge. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's huge. That's how big it is. It's absolutely huge. This is so important. I, the more I think about it, the more I pray into it, I really believe this message is the message that every person in America needs to hear because there is so much abandonment. There is so many feelings of rejection. There is so many people that are wandering, they feel like they have no home, they have no covering, they have no family, they're like an orphan, they're separated, they're abandoned. And the world, the culture, the world in which we live just uh, literally fuels that frustration in people and causes them to live lives of just separation and, and division. But I'm so glad that in the church we can celebrate what's called the spirit of adoption, that God sent his son Jesus. Romans 8 verse 15, the theme verse, you should have it memorized by now. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now I'm turning this 
uh, uh, the, the, the tables a little bit, turning a corner in the series, and uh, we're beginning to work towards our conclusion. <laughs> now, now, don't get too excited. It's probably going to take me three or four weeks to close this series. This is not the last day. There's going to be three or four more days. But we're starting to turn the corner to the close of this series. And we're going to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to read a very familiar story. It's a parable. And uh, we're going to be in this parable for a few weeks. And it's going to give us the opportunity to put into a biblical context what we've been learning about the orphan spirit. We're going to find a framework a setting where everything that we've learned about sonship, everything that we've learned about fatherhood is going to be put in the background of the story. One of the greatest parables of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son, and we're going to be in this final series now, this final chapter of this parable for, for three or four weeks. So don't get the idea this is the last Sunday. I, I, I remind myself of the pastor that I heard one time says, as I continue to close. <laughs> as I can. So I'm starting to close the series. I'm like a real estate agent. I've got multiple closings going on all at the same time. So we're going to turn our attention to Luke 15. Do you find it? And I just want to take time to read it. I, I really do. In the early church, they always devoted to the public reading of scriptures. Now, I know that we have printed Bibles now, and we have uh, media, and, and all that's a wonderful gift, but it's still important. The Word of God was written to be declared publicly and verbally. So I want you to find Luke 15, and I want to read verses 11. I'll probably stop at verse 24, which is not the entire parable, but it's the first section, and this is what we read from God's Word. I love that video. We believe this is God's inspired Word, and it can change your life. And he said, that is Jesus. Are you there? There was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, turn to your neighbor and say, you need to come to yourself. You need to wake up. You, you need to open your eyes. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough to eat, more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate for this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found and they begin to celebrate. Oh, can you give God some thanks for his word today? The parable of Jesus, the wonderful parable of the prodigal son. Now, literally, this is the parable of the prodigal family. The word prodigal means wasteful. That's what it means, the wasteful. So we have a wasteful son, but we also have a wasteful father because he was willing to just give away his love and his compassion. We've got a wasteful other brother, and all of these things are going to be brought out in this parable. Now, I want to lay a little foundation here for a minute, and I've only got a couple of things today to really speak, so I'm going to take my time. It's not going to be a lot of material, but I just want to help you so that we're prepared for the next three or four weeks at the conclusion of the series. Let me ask you about parables. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Everybody knows what the parables are, right? The stories of Jesus. Some of them were fictitious. Some of them possibly had some historical reference point. But primarily, they were, they were stories. 
Somebody said the parables are earthly stories with a heavenly message. The parables of Jesus. You ever think about why Jesus spoke with parables? Why did Jesus often speak in parables? Now, Jesus often answered questions by asking another question. That's the law of inquiry. We only find Jesus one time in the Gospels between when he was the infant in Bethlehem until he went into his ministry at the time of his baptism, and that was when he was approximately 12 years old, and they found him in the temple, and he said, you should have known that I would be asking questions of the teachers of the law because I had to be about my father's business. So Jesus often asked questions and he often taught in parables. Why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, some say, well, I think that Jesus wanted to make the message very easy to understand. That is really a misunderstanding of the parables. I don't know if you've read too many parables, but a lot of them in the natural mind without revelation of the Holy Spirit, they don't make a lot of sense. I mean, you, you don't just read the story. It wasn't to make the message childish. I think it was to make the message childlike. Big difference between childlike faith and childishness. And he wanted it to be childlike. But it, it wasn't necessarily so that everyone could understand how simple the message was about the parables. No, Jesus spoke in parables, get this, to reveal spiritual truth. But the revelation only came to those that had spiritual understanding. If a person heard a parable, if they had a heart to receive, if they had a mind that was open to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then they understood the message. But if they were closed-minded, if they were stubborn before they heard the parable, they didn't have any revelation after the parable because it revealed spiritual truth to those that had spiritual understanding. One Bible teacher said Jesus used parables both to reveal and to conceal spiritual truth because he taught do not cast your pearls before the swine. Don't give the message to someone that doesn't have the heart to receive. It. In fact, in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 11, everybody still here this morning, by the way? Look at this. Look at this verse. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. And he said to them, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. To the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. This is not political correctness being revealed here in the Word of God. This is not entitlement mentality. Jesus said, the one who has more, more will be given to him, but the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken from him. This is why I spoke to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now the next couple of verses say, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, or ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and I would heal them. But they have to have spiritual eyes and ears to hear and see the revelation. So I'm not just going to tell you the story of the prodigal son and, you know, the typical little surface interpretation of the story. Oh, that's just such a simple, nice little story. The father loves his son. That's the only thing God has to say to us. No, there's a lot more. And we're going to get a deeper revelation from this parable. Like most passages, I'm just in a teacher mode today. Is that all right? Like most passages in the Bible, there are multiple layers of revelation. Do you ever read a passage of scripture one day and you think, wow, I really understand that this is fantastic. Here's a layer of revelation. And then you read it the next day and all of a sudden you get something brand new. And you say, well, which was right? Was Monday's understanding correct or was Tuesday's understanding correct? And the answer is yes, because there are multiple layers of revelation. Or like when one person preaches or teaches on a passage of Scripture, you get one message. And then someone else reads the very same words and teaches on the very same passage of Scripture. And you get a different revelation. Because like many passages of Scripture, there is the law of multiple revelation and there are layers of revelation that God wants to give. So, so this story, for example, let me help you with this. This story could have the natural or, or the, the uh, original interpretation or revelation. It could just be a, a natural, initial, universal, uh, natural word. And the original word of the proverb, the, the parable would be that the father loved his lost son 
And he's a picture of the Father, and lost people can come to Jesus. How, how many know that's, that's the main initial, first natural revelation of, of the parable? We'll talk about that in a second. But then there is a spiritual revelation. That's where I'm going to talk about the secondary or the special, the seasonal, specific revelation. It's like the difference between the word logos and the word rhema. I don't want to speak over your head, but I want to raise you up so that you have some strength and some wisdom in your life. The Bible is called the Word of God. And the most common word in the Bible for word is the word logos. It means the universal revelation of God. It's the universal word. It's the, it's the initial word. It's the logos of God. It is applicable. It is, a, it is a universal. It is always the same. It never changes. The, and we have a word. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and it dwelt among us. Jesus is always the same. He's the universal Word of God. He's the same in every language to every person. It never changes. But then there is also special revelation. Universal revelation and special revelation. Special revelation is the word rhema, where you get a word, you're reading a verse of scripture, and all of a sudden there's something that comes out of that into your spirit and you say, wow, I really received that. That's more than just John 3.16. And there's nothing wrong with John 3.16. But there's now an additional layer of revelation that's like a rhema word. So we're going to get a rhema word from this parable of the prodigal son. We're going to get spiritual revelation. And then at the end, I'll probably, and I plan to give you what I'll call the prophetic revelation, which is an interpretation that is long range, historical, prophetic, even has to do with the end times. And you'll see in a few weeks how that this parable even applies to what's going on in our world today and how the prodigal represents one group of people and the elder brother represents another group of people. But there are multiple layers of Revelation. Everybody still here? So let's turn our attention to the lost chapter of the Bible for a minute. Did you know there's a lost chapter in the Bible? What's the lost chapter in the Bible? I'm not talking about the, you know, the books that the Catholic Church has. No, I'm not talking about that. The lost chapter in the Bible is Luke 15 because it's a story of a lost coin. It's the story of a lost sheep and it's a story of a lost son. So in the story of the lost son, we find the story of the prodigal. Now, I said this already. Prodigal means wasteful. And uh, he, of course, learned a lot after he had took the father's inheritance and squandered the, the wealth and uh, came to himself. I want to be very, very brief here. But somewhere along the line, he got his SHN degree. How many of you have that degree from the School of Hard Knocks? <laughs> he got his SHN degree. I've heard of the P, uh, PHP degree. That's when ladies work second job to put hubby through school <laughs> so he can get a degree and go on and better himself in education. But this prodigal boy, he got his SHN, the School of Hard Knocks degree. It's amazing how much people learn from the time they're 13 till the time they're 18. Come on, parents, say amen with me. You know, all of a sudden they have incredible revelation. And, and that's the natural interpretation. I'll put these words on the screen. I'll just fly through them really quick. The natural interpretation of the prodigal is that there was a demand. He said, give me my share of the family fortune. Then there was a departure. He goes out into the world and he wastes the fortune on wild living. And then there's decline. Things for him go from bad to worse. It's the perfect picture of the destructive nature of sin. You know, the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. But when that season is over, it's going to be a tough situation after that. When the summer of 69 is over, the winter of 70 is soon behind. And some of you classic rockers might have some reference to that illustration. Others, it went right over your head. Luke chapter 15, 15 says, He went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I mean, you got to, I'll talk about this later. Later, but you got an upstanding Jewish young man from a fine, wealthy family that were kosher in every respect. But he has went into the pit of decline, and he's in the pig's uh, trough, feeding the pigs, longing to eat what they were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he was in despair. Then he came to a discovery. 
He said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread and I perish here with hunger. So finally he made a decision. I will arise and go back to my father and I will say I have sinned against heaven and against you. Now that's the initial layer of revelation of the prodigal son story. And let me say this before I move on and I want to move quickly. If you have ever left the father, I don't know if there's anyone in this room today. There may be. There may not be. But if there's someone in this room today that is away from God, you've went the wrong way, you have backslid, you have made decisions. Maybe you once knew God. You once lived in relationship with Jesus Christ. You were a faithful uh, participant in the work of God in your life, but you have went the wrong direction. You have made mistakes. You have uh, revealed what I believe is God's definition of sin. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned unto his own way. If that's been true in your life, I want you to know if you'll come to a decision today and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Oh, I'm here to tell you he'll forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed. He'll make you as ready for heaven as if you're already there. Oh, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Oh, I'll tell you what, there is so much in the response of the Father. The, oh, I'm going to tell you about this in a little while, but just hold on to me. When the Father saw the Son coming back, he did not stand from afar off and said, just make him crawl back to my front door. He did not and I don't know if you've got a picture of a religious God because this father had a religious son and he had a rebellious son and both of them went the wrong direction but when the rebellious son came back to the father, the Bible says the father ran to meet him. I want to talk about that in a minute. He welcomed him. He received him. He said go get the best robe in the house and put it on him. Go get the signet ring of the family and put it on his finger. Go kill the fattened calf because we're going to celebrate this son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead and now he is alive. How many people do I have in the house today that say, Pastor I was once dead. I was once dead in transgressions and sins but I came to the Father and the Father didn't reject me. He revealed what Jesus said. If anyone comes to me I will in no wise cast him out but I will receive him. How many have been received today and you're in right relationship with God because the spirit of adoption has given you a relationship with the Father. Now, in the days that are come, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the spiritual revelation of this parable. And this is really where I'm at now. I'm only going to give you one point today. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't believe pastor's only going to preach one point today. It's a long introduction. A long introduction. But one truth today. I'm going to give you, I've got ten. There may be more. Only one today. Don't get nervous. I'm going to give you 10, at least 10, what I think are destructive characteristics of the orphan spirit. Characteristics of this orphan spirit that is so active in our world today that literally seeks to... The Bible says the thief comes but for to rob, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And this orphan spirit, this destructive abandonment, separation, rejection mentality that's so strong in our world today, it literally wants to destroy people. And I'm going to identify ten destructive characteristics of the orphan spirit. But today I'm just going to lay one out here for you. And I just want to drive this one home for a little while. Look at this. This is number one of ten. Only one today. The orphan spirit seeks to influence. What does it say? All. Somebody say all. All. All sons and daughters. Not just a few, but all. Not just those that are in the church or those outside the church, but all. Not just rebellious sons, but also religious sons. All sons and daughters of the Father. The orphan spirit seeks to influence everybody. Luke 15, 11 says, and he said, Jesus' parable, there was a man who had two sons. Regardless of your father. I want to drive this home. If you'll connect with me and receive this, I can speak it quickly. If you stare at me like you're not understanding what I'm saying, I can repeat myself five or six times. How many are going to listen really good? Can I see your hand? If you will realize that every person on the planet has the potential and has to guard against this influence of the orphan spirit. 
I don't care. Look at the story. There are two sons. And they both had the same father. Now, he's a good father. I'll talk about that a little while. But not only was he a good father, we're under the headship of the good, good father. And even though the two sons were in the same house and they both had the same father and the fact that he was a good father and yet they were influenced by this spirit. Now, when I say spirit, I've said this before, I'm not wanting you to get the idea of some austere, some dramatic, some demonic possession thing. I'm not wanting you to picture something like some Hollywood movie where something has to be cast out of people and they burp it up into a plastic bag or something. That could happen, but I'm talking about an influence. I'm talking about thoughts that come into your mind and the Sources of those thoughts, influence from other people, influence from the media, influence from the culture in which we live. A spirit, a spirit is an influence. Turn to your neighbor and say, a spirit is an influence. That's the greatest thing I've ever learned about a spirit. It's an influence. And an influence wants to cause you to feel rejected, abandoned, cast off, forsaken, offended, forgotten. Nobody cares. Nobody really knows. Nobody really is able to meet my situation. And that's spirit, that orphan spirit, oh, I'm telling you, it is so active in our world today, and it affects all people. People that have poor earthly fathers can be affected by the orphan spirit. Now, I taught one Sunday about the fact that there's five kinds of fathers. There's the performance-oriented father, the passive father, if you remember this. There's the absentee father, the authoritarian father. There's even the abusive father. And if you had a poor example, now number one, I'm going to tell you to get over it. Whether you had a good father or a bad father is no excuse for the decisions that you're making in your life today. You need to make a determination to pick yourself up and thank God that there's a good, good father in heaven that loves you and sent his son Jesus to die. I don't care if you were abandoned or rejected. I don't even, I don't mean this means spirited. Please don't be offended. I don't care if you were abused. Don't live in that abuse the rest of your life. Pick yourself up and say, I can believe that the healing of Jesus can come to my memories and by his trust. I am healed and I don't have to live in that pit the rest of my life. I can live in victory and strength because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But if you had a bad father, I'm going to tell you what, that influence can get released into your life and there can be that cycle of abandonment and brokenness and rejection that can be released on you. But I'm going to tell you what, Luke 15 is the story of a good father. The man in this parable was a good dad. He loved his kids. He was a wealthy landowner. He had accumulated some wealth. He was an upstanding Jewish citizen. He was a loving, comparing, compassionate man. But both of his sons developed an orphan spirit. We concentrate on the first son. He's the rebellious one. I'll concentrate later on the second son. He's the religious one. They both had an orphan spirit. And I want you to listen to this real clear. I don't care who you are. If you are either a son or a daughter, and I think that pretty much covers everybody in the house. <laughs> We're not like Target or Facebook. We don't have 59 check boxes for you to choose your gender. You're either one or the other. You're either a son or a daughter. And if you are a son or a daughter, then this spirit of the orphan nature is going to want to influence you. Whether you had a good father or whether you had a poor father. And you can say, well, pastor, I and this is on my heart, so just receive it. I really believe there are some people. Now, I don't sense any pushback. You know what I mean by pushback? When I'm preaching these sermons, I don't see anybody shaking their head. I don't need anybody going like this. You know, talk to the hand because I'm not listening. You know, I don't sense any feedback. But I do know that it's possible that a spirit could influence influence you to think, well, I've got a good earthly father. I had a wonderful parent. I had a, and I did, and I'm so thankful for that. And I put myself in that category. But just because I had wonderful earthly parents does not mean that the orphan spirit is not going to try to get in my mind, get in my thinking, get in the way I produce and operate my life because the orphan spirit wants to attack all sons and daughters. And here's one in my heart. This is the main thing I want to drive home today. Don't discount these messages I've been preaching 
thinking they don't apply to you. Don't say, well, I've got a wonderful earthly parent or, or my parent is going on to be with Jesus. Or, or, but I thank God I had a wonderful earthly parent. So I understand what pastor's saying. And there's so many abandoned and broken and abused and neglected people in our world today. And I'm sure that message applies to all those other people. No, that message applies to all those other people. That message also applies to you because the spirit of darkness is no respecter of person. And if he can use trauma in a person's life to get off on them with a spirit of rejection and abandonment, he can also use other things in your life to influence you to feel separated and abused and neglected every person in this room and I know what I'm talking about you have to guard against the orphan spirit that will get operating and loose inside your life good father bad father no father absentee father it doesn't matter allow the Holy Spirit to realize these messages are for you how many receivers do I have in the house today that's I appreciate that I really am burdened in my heart today, if you can't tell. I'm just really opening that up. You remember that Sunday we talked about, we'd get it sort of humorously, you might be an orphan if, remember? We made fun of the Jeff Foxworthy statement, you might be a redneck if. So we said, you might be an orphan if. Remember that? I think this applies to everybody in the house. You might be an orphan if, let me just remind you. You don't put down the roots in one church. You just drift from body to body to God body without any roots. You might be an orphan. If you're always searching for something bigger and better, you might be an orphan if your faith is only as strong as your feelings. You might be an orphan if you only really know love when you are feeling love. You might be an orphan if you have a need for recognition. You don't do anything if it's not recognized. You get your feelings hurt easily. You can't take correction from someone who really wants to speak what's in the best entrance for your life. And here's the ultimate. You might be an orphan if you really don't know who you are. Because your identity will come from your father. And if you don't know who your father is, you won't know who you are. But if you can understand who your father is, you'll get an identity. And your self-portrait will be rooted and grounded in the spirit of Jesus. And you will understand that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am complete. I am strong. I am smart. I am anointed. I am gifted. I've got an assignment. And I'm on a mission to fulfill what God is going to do in my life. But you might be an orphan if. And oh, hear me, church, this morning. Don't allow the enemy to put a smoke screen and say, well, you know, those messages pastors preaching don't apply to you. I'm telling you, they do. I'm telling you, they apply to everyone in this room. It wants to influence all of the father's sons and daughters. He was a good father. Are you tracking with me on that? In the parable, this was a good father. And yet the good father had sons that dealt with these feelings of abandonment. Can I give you another son? Can, can I talk about the best son? Who's the best son that ever lived on the earth? Jesus. Oh, i got revelation for you here if you can receive it. You'll never know who your father is until you know you're a son of the father. And even though Jesus was the son of the most high God, Philippians chapter 2 says he did not take equality with God, something to be taken for granted, but he made himself of no reputation and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore the father exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He was Lord and master of all because he knew he was a son before he was a savior. Oh, somebody needs to tweet that. He knew he was a son before he knew he was a savior. He knew he was a sacrifice on the cross, but that revealing came out of his assignment because his first assignment was be a son of the most high God. Oh, I tell you what, I just got blessed. Praise the Lord. Somebody keep praying. But get a hold of this. Even though he was the perfect, sinless son of God, without sin, without error, paying the price for our sins on the cross, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, says about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is interpreting, my God, 
my God, why have you forsaken me? We're not talking about someone down the street. We're not talking about some fictional character. We're talking about the son of the Most High God that never sinned, not one single solitary time in his entire life. And yet he was susceptible to the influence of the spirit of abandonment. And when he's paying the price for our sins on the cross, he said, Father, I feel like an orphan here on this cross. I feel lost. I feel rejected. I feel abandoned. I feel like I have been cast aside. And if Jesus knew what it was to feel like an orphan, don't think for a moment that that same spirit of abandonment won't try to attach itself to you. You are no better than Jesus. A teacher, a, a student is not above his teacher. A, a, a servant is not above his master. And if Jesus knew what it was to feel abandoned and broken, don't be surprised if that same slithering snake with that evil influence tries to get into your mind and get into your brain and get you think that nobody loves you, that nobody cares for you, that nobody's there for you. But we read in the Gospels that when Jesus was attacked by Satan three times, he said, it is written it is written it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God that's why here at family first and I promised to preach quick this morning that's why I'm trying to talk faster so I can put more words in the amount of time that I'm taking this morning that's why here at family first we've got a book that is a book of revelation it is a book of wisdom and this book if we will hide it deep within our hearts will give us the ability and when Satan comes in like a flood we're able to say, but you know what? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against the living God. And when the devil tells me I'm rejected and I'm abandoned and I'm cast aside and nobody loves me, I quote the word of God that says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world because no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. This is the heritage of the saints of God. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he will destroy the works of the devil. I've just given you, you didn't realize it, I've just given you my three main weapons that I use every day in my life. Every day of my life. Satan attacks me, he comes to me, tries to discourage, tries to defeat, tries to get me to buy into this abandonment mentality. Those are my three strong suits right there. I say, Satan, I'm getting up to bat and strike one. Strike two, strike three, Satan, you're out. Get you some word inside of you. Get you some strength that says it's not about your feelings. It's not about your emotions. It's not about whether you have the joy of the Lord or not. I've got the joy of the Lord and I'm thankful for it. But you know what? Joy is a whole lot different than happiness. And I'll have the joy of the Lord no matter what happenstance comes into my life because my joy is found in fulfilling the word and the mission of God in my life. And that's my ability to take the word and apply it. Oh, I got, I, I'm just spontaneous. I'm off of that. So let me get back up here real quick. Some, you see, some of you... When I said I'm going to preach short, you, you took that literally. I, I can't imagine why you did that, but I, I do want to do that. Jesus said this in John 14, 18. I will never leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Can I give you the conclusion here? I'm going to talk in the future about the ten characteristics. This first one is it affects every son and daughter. It affects every person on the planet. And I'm going to give you nine more negative characteristics. But I want to give you a revelation here as I close of the good, good father. Meredith, why don't you come on up, sweetheart? Pastor Meredith. Aren't you glad he's a good, good father? Oh, I love that song we sing. But it's more than a song. It's a biblical revelation. He's a good, good father. And your Bible says this, Luke 15, 22, 23 and 24. Look at it on the screen. This is why I put it on the screen. This is why I work hard.
hard to put stuff on the YouVersion Bible app and email things and, and post things on Facebook and Twitter so that what I say are not just sayings that sound good in the atmosphere, but they're printed on paper or they're printed on digital format and you can put that word inside of you and live into your destiny. So this is what the father said to his servants. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. This is a revelation of the good, good father. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and it is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they begin to celebrate. This is the son that walked away. I'll talk about this in the future, but this is the son who literally said, Dad, I want He said, I want my inheritance. Now, I'm no uh, scientist, but I know that in any culture, sons don't get an inheritance as long as the father is still living. And the son, get a hold of this. I can't linger. I'll talk about it in the future. He literally said, Dad, I don't care about you. It's all about me. I wish you were dead so that I could get my inheritance now instead of waiting for you to kick the bucket. This is the son that wasted everything. This is the son who totally lost his identity. He humiliated the family. He went into a far off country. Can I give you a real quick thing here? The Bible says he went to get a job in a far country. You know why? Because nobody in Israel would hire him. Nobody down the street would treat him normal because everyone in the community knew that he was a rebellious son. He had humiliated, he had dishonored his father. And literally in the Jewish culture, all of the father's relatives and associates and, 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 and neighbors, they literally had authority to take vengeance on behalf of the father. And they could have literally taken the son out and there would have been no retribution whatsoever because they were honoring the father who had a rebellious son. That's why he had to go far, 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 far away from home. But I got news for you. If you think you can run from God, you'll never get far enough to get out of God's grasp. You'll never go far enough to get out of the reach of the almighty hand of God. And it is in a faraway country. And he says when he's coming back that the father did several things. Can I say you this? The father said, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Do you ever think about what robe he's talking about? Do you think he said, well, you know, we knew when you left home that someday you'd be back. So we took your best clothes and we, we pressed them and we put mothballs on them. And I, I've never understood that. Could somebody please explain to me that horrible stench of something called a mothball and why in the world you have something that devious in yours? I'm trying to... Probably somebody's going to get mad at me. Huh? But I tell you what, I can smell those things a mile away and they stink so bad. I'd rather let the moths eat my clothes than wear them after they've been stored in mothballs. Come on, somebody. He, he said... We, we didn't put your clothes in storage, son. Because in our culture, when you walked away, you were considered dead. We had no idea that you were ever coming back. So when he said to his servants, go get the best robe. <laughs> you know what robe he was talking about? He's talking about his own robe. His father's robe. In the culture... The Jewish landowners had these long, flowing robes. And their robes were elaborate. They were monogrammed. They, they were embroidered. I've, I've got a pastor friend of mine. I was in one of his meetings one time, and I was sitting in the front row, Omar, and I was just amazed. He had his initials embroidered on the hem of his trousers. And I thought, wow, that's really something. And here's this good father. He says, quick, go get my robe. And they run and they bring out the father's robe. It probably took several of them to carry it because it was embroidery and there were jewels and, and there were gems and there were all kinds of intricate designs on that robe. But he said to his, his servant, somebody go get that one special robe and, and bring it in. And the, the Bible says that he put that robe on his son. 
his identity. Now I got ahead of myself a little bit, but let me tell you this. The tradition was that when they had those long flowing heavy robes, that's a long flowing heavy robe. The more elaborate it was, was a reflection of the wealthier that landowner was. The more embroidery, the more gems, the more rhinestones, the flashier it was, was an indication of the more wealth he had. <laughs> and get a hold of this. The more wealthy he was, the slower he walked. You getting that picture? He's styling. How many know what I'm talking about? By styling. I think Miss Pam knows what I'm talking about. About styling. I'm telling you what, when some folks go to church, they don't dress up like they're going to Walmart. They dress up like they're going to the house of God. Because they're going to the house of the Father. And they put on their very best. And when they come in, they're styling. They got their hats. They got their robes. They got their shoes polished. Ever been in a black church? Anybody ever been in a black church? I think what they do is they start the music and the whole congregation comes down the aisle styling as they come in. I mean, that's what they do. The music is playing and, and the choir comes in. Ain't nobody do me like Jesus. I mean, I mean, they got that. Oh, man. It, I'd love to preach it about black. Well, some of you pray that some black pastor will invite me someday to preach in his church. I mean, that would be so awesome. And they're styling. And the father said, go get my robe. And then it says he ran. I think it's a couple of verses ahead of this. I think it's verse number 20. Can, do I have that one? It says he, he ran. When the son was still a long ways off and his father saw him, he was filled with compassion for him and he ran. He had that long flowing robe. He had to tuck the robe up under his, his belt. He had to somehow, you know, the Bible talks about girding up your loins. That's what they're talking about. Taking the long flowing robes of your, of your, your garments and tucking it up under, your, under, under your, your belt so that you girded up your loins. Now you're ready for action. Now you're not just styling, but now you're ready for business. And the Bible says he ran to his son. And then he said, go get the ring. What ring was it? It was the family signet ring. It had a, a crown. It had a crest. It, it had indications of all of the wealth and, and the tribe and the rank and the order and the, and the pomp and the circumstance and all the symbols of the family heritage because he said, I want to put this ring, son, on your finger because I want everybody to know that you belong to me. Your identity is no longer squandered and lost, but I want to restore it back to you because you're a son of the family father and he put shoes on his feet and he said kill the fattened calf we're gonna have a party let us eat and celebrate for the son of mine was lost and is found he was dead but now he's alive forevermore and I want you to know everyone in this house that's what the good good father wants to do for you if you will just turn I tweeted a tweet this morning if I can remember how I said it in the wee hours of the morning the father is ready to run to the rescue of any of the sons that will turn if you will just turn if you will just let, if you're lost today and if you're away from God I'm telling you the good father he will not wait for you to crumb and gravel at the altar he's not saying son crawl in the dirt I want to humiliate you and embarrass you oh you are just so bad no if all you will do is turn and if you will just give God one chance he will run to your rescue and he will welcome you he'll put the robe of right Righteousness around you. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And my identity is put on my finger. I've got the shoes fitted with the gospel of peace because he's given me an assignment. And he's even said there's going to be a marriage supper where I'm going to kill the fatted calf and we're going to have a party like you can never believe because this son of mine was dead. But now he's alive. He's a lost. 
But now he's found us. Any sons of the Father here this morning in the house? Come on, rise to your feet. Any sons or daughters of the Most High God that have had the spirit of adoption destroy the abandonment and the brokenness over your life. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, shoot up your hands and celebrate. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. I don't know if we need the team. I don't know if we want everybody to come up here, but I just want you to celebrate this morning. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. Oh, he loves you. He's got a plan for your life. And if you would have been the only one that needed a Savior, he would have sent his son Jesus. And he wants to put the robe on your shoulders. He wants to put the ring on your hand. He wants to put the feet fitted with the gospel of peace on your shoes. He wants to give you hope and joy beyond your own. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Father. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Break all just gather in with me. Just just move on up towards the front. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. Just move on. Get the revelation of sonship. Get the revelation of sonship so that you can worship the Father. Hallelujah. got their opinions, but there's only one opinion that matters. your father in heaven has a plan and a purpose for your life and I don't care what the enemy has ever said I don't care what any lion demon has ever said to you any abusive father that has planted some sort of a mindset inside of you that you deserve to be mistreated that you're not a wonderful son or a daughter that you've got something to be ashamed of that you'll never live up to the heron I don't care what word of demonic influence has ever been spoken inside of you. There's a father in heaven that says, my son or my daughter, I'm proud of you. I love you. And I've got potential loosed inside of you. And I've got a plan for you to fulfill because you are my son. You are my daughter. And I treasure what has put and put inside of you. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Bravo. Just wanted to share a story. The old church we used to go to there used to be this room called the soaking room before services. And, uh, You'd go in there before services and just they'd be playing like this normal worship music and just real soft and just kind of like get focused and get your heart prepared for the service and stuff. And mostly the leaders would go in there and just get prepared, you know, worship, worship team, prayer team, intercessory team, um, stuff like that. And uh, remember before service, I went in there because I was leading worship that 
that night. Uh, we had our services on Saturday night. But I went in there for a couple minutes before and um, it's just worshiping God. And um, I just feel a little insecure about myself that day, I guess. I didn't know what to expect and there was a lot of influence um, in my mind about who I was and this and that. And uh, I remember the Lord, but just this presence just began to move in the room and I felt it and it hit me like a wave and I fell to my knees. As I'm down there, I'm just crying and I'm like, God, what, what's going on? And I literally felt him walk up to me. And as I'm sitting there, I'm, as I'm on my knees, I feel he, he, he clothed me with, it was as if he's, he's taken a garment and he clothed me with it. And he goes, this is the garment of royalty. It was purple. He goes, you're my son. So I was weeping. As I'm sitting there, I literally felt it on me. I guess I was there for, I want to say 10 minutes. This woman came from the other side of the room and she goes, while you were praying on your knees, I saw God walk up to you and he put it was as if it was a, put a garment over you. I think from that point on, I just felt so approved and so qualified. And uh, there's just the affirmation that came with it. There's, there's nothing like when God affirms you as a son, it is the best thing in the world. And I think that from that day on, I've never been the same since. And that's my revelation, that's my cry, my heart, that people, men and women, would become so vulnerable so that God can, can begin to put that garment around you and say, I've qualified you. There's nothing that you can do to earn my love, but I give it extravagantly and it's free. There's no pre-qualifications because his love conquered everything. And I think it's in the same vein as pastors preaching with the robe of a father over his son. And there's no better affirmation than to get your father's approval. So I just, I just really believe today that God wants to begin to robe, to, to, to bring out this cloth, this garment of praise, garment of sonship, garment of royalty, and begin to wrap it around you. And today's the day where, where you actually get to feel it. So I just bless you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just release, Father, the garment of sonship over this house. The garment of affirmation, God. The garment where we finally feel secure of where we stand in your eyes. But there's no everyday wondering where we stand and are we saved and are we not saved and are we good? Are you mad at us? Are you... Are you confused at us? Uh, are you confused at our lifestyle? Are we doing things right? No. Full 100% security and knowing that you're a son and knowing that you're a daughter and that now nothing can separate you from the love of God. No matter how far you run, you'll always be a son. So just release that over you today. I just wanted to share an encounter I had. So I bless you this morning. Thank you so much. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I didn't want to embarrass you only, but I, I just did that because you represent everybody, okay? Everybody in the room. And that identifies with what you were saying. That robe of the Father wants to just rest on your shoulder the affirmation that you're a son you're a daughter of the father oh hallelujah 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 praise your father i tell you what we'll do i'm like all in right now out tuckered out whatever you want to call it but I'm still all in.
And I want to invite my wife, Crystal, and Pastor Omar, and Mandy, and Joel, if you want to help us, and um, other leaders, um, if you'd just like to be prayed for, would like to just lay our hands on you and speak a word of blessing and encouragement to you. If you'd like someone to be a tangible expression of the embrace of the Father, just move up closer towards the front here. Now, you guys don't all have to leave, but if, if you're hungry, if you just want that today, you, you get up here closer. And uh, we'll just take a few minutes and we'll just uh, bless you and cover you today with the love of the Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on up, Richard. Come on up, Richard. Others? Hunger. It's about hunger. It's what it's all about. Yeah. Barbara, stepping on up. Melissa, here. Others, just, just step on up.
Well, praise the Lord. I feel like we're sons and daughters of the Father, don't you? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Well, sometimes we just never really know what the Holy Spirit plans and what things are going to do. We do have plans to try to want to do that video, don't we? And if we had everybody that's right here right now to help us, that'd be a really big plus, wouldn't it? Uh, what we're going to do, and some of you need to kind of like wipe your eyes and do a few things like that. I understand that. But uh, we're going to go over here into the hallway, and uh, there's a room that's set up with a camera and some lights, and uh, say like three words, it's just like three words, that's all. So um, I know uh, Michelle and Joel, and I think Joe's helping. They're going to go get ready. And uh, as you can, just uh, transition over into the hallway here. And we'd love to make this little special. It's going to be part of our all-in promotion. And we think it's going to be a powerful way of communicating to people what God's doing in our lives. So we'd appreciate your help. We can just circle over this way. That would be a tremendous, tremendous blessing.